Tonight, Toronto is coming alive again. The city announcing today the return of major in-person events. Pride Toronto 2022 will be bigger than ever. That's not the only big event making a comeback this year. From the CNE to the Caribbean Carnival, after two years filled with cancellations, the city says it's ready to celebrate. Plus... It has truly been an honour and a very great privilege, um, especially during a pandemic. As Minister of Health, Christine Elliott has been at the forefront of Ontario's fight against COVID-19. Today, she announced she's moving on from political life. And... Get ready for a dose of spring this weekend. Temperatures hitting double digits on Sunday, but it won't last long. We'll have all your weather details. Good evening, I'm Kelda Yoon. Well, it may be the biggest sign yet that life in Toronto is starting to get back to normal. After two years of cancellations or having to go virtual, the mayor announced today some of the city's biggest events are returning in person this year. Ardell Manakda joins us live from Greektown, where Taste of the Danforth will be back this year. Adele, that's just one of the many events Torontonians have to look forward to. Yeah, Kelda, you better start planning and get ready for a full slate of events. All of the big ones will be back, starting with the St. Patrick's Day Parade in just a couple of weeks. The Toronto Caribbean Carnival, they'll be back. They already have a ticker on their website counting down the days. But TIFF, the CNE, the Pride Parade, they're all on the docket. And these events are about more than just the entertainment. The Greektown BIA tells me that just a few years ago, Taste of the Danforth had an economic impact of more than $65 million. And that's thanks to 1.6 million visitors in just three days and we know that these local businesses they need the support welcome back Toronto and welcome back to Toronto because it's something we've been waiting to say for quite some time the summer schedule is heating up after two years of mainly virtual events the cooking the dancing and the marching are heading back to the streets it is the reward for the incredible efforts that Torontonians have made getting vaccinated and having patience with public health restrictions. Event organizers and participants are ready to go bigger and better than ever. People will be coming from all over the world. We, our phone lines and emails at Pride have not stopped. Our social media have been buzzing with folks eager and ready to come into Toronto. We've brought in people that have worked on Olympic openings and Super Bowls to create a, a kind of virtual reality pyrotechnics uh, projection uh, event that really engulfs everybody. The CNE says the X adds 128 million to the province and 93 million to the city every summer. The fair also employs 5,000 people, including over 1,000 performers. And speaking of performers, Erin Brockovich, who hosts Drag Brunch in Toronto's Village, can't wait to perform. She did virtual Pride two years ago, but nothing compares to being in person. And you can hear the crowd react to what you're doing. You can hear the laughs, you can hear the cheers, you can build a connection and a rapport with an audience. And I, nothing really matches that energy, especially at those Pride events. Meanwhile, businesses in Toronto's Greek town are already prepping for Taste of the Danforth. Aaron Gamlin, who owns Lewis Cipher Brewworks, says businesses there, particularly restaurants, need a big boost. Thank you. So that really hurt us. Those three days are the busiest days of the year for most of us on the Danforth. Now, the mayor says that the city's pandemic recovery does depend on the tourism dollars that these events bring in, but also that locals need to support them year round. Now, we don't know what the public health situation is going to be like when these events take place. The CNE, they're going to have some contactless payment, some distancing and, measure, and some traffic control, but they're ready to go full steam ahead, Kelda. Exciting stuff. Thanks so much, Dale. That's our Dale Manuk reporting live for us tonight. Now to a story that CBC News broke last night. Christine Elliott, Ontario's Deputy Premier and Health Minister, will not seek re-election. She joins a lengthy list of MPPs who won't be running for Doug Ford's Progressive Conservatives in June. Now today we heard from Elliott herself. Our Queen's Park reporter Mike Crawley has more. Doug Ford and Christine Elliott have been political allies and friends for years. We had a chat about a, a month ago and... Um, 
Christine has chosen to, to move on. As Ford's deputy premier and health minister, Elliot has been at the forefront of the government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, she's thanking the public servants behind the scenes. To the uh, wonderful people in the uh, Ministry of Health, uh, they have done extraordinary work working around the clock for the last two years. Elliot was first elected nearly 16 years ago. Back then, the Ontario PC party leader was John Tory. I completely understand, um, you know, why she might want to uh, move on to other things uh, in her life after all this time, I think 13 years uh, in uh, public life. But she's done a good job and she can be proud of that and uh, she'll be missed. From the NDP leader, a far less flattering portrait of Elliot. She made choices, as did Doug Ford, that were the wrong choices, that were bad choices. They were, they were eviscerating public health before the pandemic even came. Christine Elliott could have been Ontario's premier right now. She lost the PC leadership to Ford by the slimmest of margins. It was her third try running for party leader. In her riding of Newmarket Aurora, constituents react to Elliott's news. It's been a rough two years, so I'm sure it was very hard on her and her family life. I don't blame her. I'm concerned about the election and the team. 76 progressive Conservatives won in the last election. With Elliott's departure, 18 of them will not be running for the party in June. That's nearly one quarter of Doug Ford's original caucus. He insists that doesn't matter. I can honestly say we have a better slate now than we did from the, the previous. Elliott will stay on as health minister for the rest of the government's term. After that? Once the election happens, I will uh, take some time off, but I'm looking at some other possibilities in the uh, in the private sector. This will be the first provincial election since 2003 without Christine Elliott as a candidate. Mike Crawley, CBC News, Toronto. Randy Hillier also won't be running again in his eastern Ontario riding. Hillier was first elected in 2007 as a progressive conservative in Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston. He was kicked out of the Conservative caucus in 2019, then served as an independent MPP. Hillier aligned himself with People's Party leader Maxime Bernier. He called people who followed pandemic rules stupid and at one point compared Ontario's pandemic response to the Nazis. Hillier was also charged for attending anti-pandemic mandates events. In a video posted to Facebook, Hillier says the political system is broken. Meteorologist Nick Cernkovich joins us now with a first look at the forecast. And Nick, another sunny day and it's also starting to warm up a little bit. They are, yeah. Calder, when you look at the temperatures today, I mean, we hit plus one degree. Um, it felt really warm. Mind you, this is still a couple degrees below the seasonal average, but compared to what we've had over the last few days, this wasn't too bad. Lots in the way of sunshine today. Tomorrow, a little bit more in the way of cloud cover, but we've got warming weather uh, moving in. So a mix of sun and cloud to mostly cloudy skies for tomorrow. And then as we head through tomorrow night into Sunday, we've got some windy conditions. And Sunday might actually bring with it some pretty strong rainfall, but with that, some pretty warm temperatures as well. And doesn't last long, though, into Monday. This all clears out. We're going to get to this in the long-range forecast. For now, though, here's a look at the next 24 hours. Down to minus 4 degrees tonight. Wind chill of minus 8 tomorrow. High of plus 4 degrees. A mix of sun and cloud at best, but likely more on the side of cloudy. Uh, high of 4 and windy conditions. And that's going to continue as we move through Sunday with even warmer weather in store. Your full five-day forecast coming up in just a bit. Thanks so much, Nick. Russia continues its push into Ukraine with more attacks, missiles and shelling. But NATO allies are ruling out any plans to establish a no-fly zone over the country. Despite repeated pleas, the head of the alliance says sending NATO fighter planes to police Ukraine's airspace would only escalate an already horrific situation. We understand the desperation, but we also believe that if we did that, we we'll end up with something that could end in a full-fledged war in Europe, involving many more countries and uh, causing much more human suffering. NATO members, including Canada, have been sending lethal arms to help Ukraine as it defends itself against the invasion. But there are no plans for a military action that could put the alliance in direct conflict with Russia. Many Western governments have welcomed the investigation by the International Criminal Court. They say Russia's Vladimir Putin and the, his Belarusian counterpart will need to be held accountable for war crimes committed during this conflict. 
Moscow is taking more steps to stifle opposition to its invasion of Ukraine within its own borders. A new law approved by the Upper House of Parliament today could jail someone for up to 15 years for spreading so-called fake news. Now, that's any information that goes against the Russian government's position on its war in Ukraine. Several foreign news agencies, including the CBC, BBC and CNN, have temporarily suspended its reporting from the ground in order to protect staff. Russia is also banning social media platforms Facebook and Twitter. The Prime Minister is heading to Europe this weekend. Justin Trudeau announced today he will be there meeting with allies to discuss the war in Ukraine and other matters. I'll be traveling to the United Kingdom, to Latvia, to Germany and Poland to meet with partners and allies. We'll of course be discussing uh, how to continue to support Ukraine, how to strengthen democratic values around the world and how to stand up even more for democracy, to stand against uh, Russia aggression, uh, and to work very hard on combating the kind of disinformation and misinformation that we know is uh, a facet of day-to-day -day life these days, but a particularly strong facet of uh, this conflict, this war in Ukraine. The Canadian military is leading an international battle group in Latvia. Trudeau will talk with leaders about economic recovery and fighting climate change. Now, the Prime Minister made the comments during an announcement in Mississauga, where transit will be getting a financial boost from all three levels of government. Our government will be investing over $271 million for transit in Mississauga. And the province is proud to contribute $225 million to doing a few things here. Reducing commute times, increasing the time you get to spend with your family, lessening the time you're sitting in traffic or on a bus. We're also making sure that we go greener. 358 My Way buses will be off diesel. The Prime Minister also joined by Mississauga Mayor Bonnie Crombie. The federal, provincial and municipal funding will total almost $700 million. In addition to the purchase of 358 hybrid My Way buses, there will also be a new rapid transit bus corridor along Dundas Street from Confederation Parkway to the Etobicoke Creek. The money will also help pay for upgrades to existing bus corridors in Mississauga. Well, environmentalists are sounding the alarm over a new recycling plan from the province. It's known as advanced recycling. And as Trevor Dunn reports, some projects won't have to go undergo any environmental assessment. Diane Sachs laid out objectives for how the Ontario government should handle recycling back in her 2017 report. The former environment commissioner and current Green Party candidate says the government's latest recycling policy belongs in the trash. This is classic Ford. It's pretend recycling as an excuse for deluging us with more plastic while keeping the public in the dark. Advanced recycling is an emerging technology that uses heat and chemicals to break down plastics and reuse the material. The government's changes would make it easier for projects to get off the ground by exempting some from environmental assessments. We have a flood of plastic and the oil companies and the plastic companies have kept saying to people, now, 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 don't worry, we're going to recycle it. So this is the latest uh, excuse for not getting rid of those plastics uh, by pretending to recycle them. As an industry association, we do not want to see plastics going into landfill. That is material that's incredibly valuable and does not belong in the environment. It should be recirculated in the economy. About 50% of plastics can be recycled using traditional methods. Advanced recycling targets the other half, and proponents say it works. Advanced recycling is a fundamental shift change. It essentially takes the plastic back to its molecular origins, and we're looking to reuse those molecules back into making new plastic products. Environmental groups are also worried about the safety of the technology, which is still new and only happening in a handful of locations in Canada. Really what they're doing is burning garbage, converting it into fuel, and hoping that we just think the problem's gone away. Ontario's Environment Ministry says that advanced recycling takes place in a low or no oxygen setting that doesn't support burning. It adds that under the new regulations, projects that don't undergo an environmental assessment would still be subject to other environmental standards and laws. Trevor Dunn, CBC News, Toronto. 
Welcome back. As pandemic restrictions continue to ease around the world, some are starting to think about taking that long delayed vacation. Now, if you're one of them, health officials have some tips on how to have fun and stay safe. Ali Chiasson has more. Need a vacation? You're freer and safer to do that now compared to last year. But COVID-19 is still circulating. And now that restrictions have eased and you can travel again, Health Canada recommends the following. Checking in on local epidemiological data. Are you visiting a hotspot? Any outbreaks you need to be aware of? Still pack sanitizer and masks. Be aware of any local restrictions or mandates so you're not caught by surprise. If you're traveling within Canada, you'll notice restrictions vary from province to province. Alberta and Saskatchewan no longer have mask or vaccine requirements, whereas BC and Quebec will still be checking vac status for a few more weeks. But regardless if you're staying here or flying outside of Canada, Dr. Teresa Tam says one of the best things you can do is... Getting up to date with COVID-19 vaccines, including getting a booster dose if you're eligible, and especially for those aged 50 years or older, is important preparation for safer activities and travels. Then you've just got to do your own risk assessment. It's the same thing, you know, you need to look at your own personal situation, your risk factors, and then obviously look at the situation and where you're going and what's the epidemiology, like how, how widely is the virus circulating in, in your destination. And then, of course, uh, look at what kind of activities you're going to be doing. If you're going to be spending most of your time outdoors, maybe, you know, uh, hiking. As opposed to? A vacation uh, outside the country where you will be mostly indoors, you know, uh, maybe, uh, you know, bar hopping or whatever. <laughs> No matter what style of holiday you're after, public health officials agree as the Omicron wave recedes, a return to normal life is prudent, but... We must use all that we have learned to do this safely and make it last. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. The Buffalo Sabres cross-border rivalry with the Toronto Maple Leafs is heading outdoors next weekend. The two teams facing off in the Heritage Classic at Hamilton's Tim Hortons Field for Maple Leafs GM Kyle Dubas playing in Steeltown is a homecoming of sorts. I spent a lot of my uh, time here after school uh, living in Hamilton. My wife's from here. I spent a lot of time at uh, this stadium and, and at Ivor Wynn. So um, it's, uh, it's really exciting for me personally. It's great for the, the city of Hamilton to have the game here. And it's a very passionate uh, sports town. This will be the third outdoor NHL game of the season, but the only one in Canada and the only one where a Canadian team is playing. And you're looking at a live shot of the Toronto skyline. A bit cloudy with a few clear breaks tonight. Temperatures at the moment hovering around the freezing mark. Now those will, temperatures will creep way up as we approach Sunday. And let's go back to Nick. Nick, hard to believe we will be hitting double digits on Sunday. I know it comes with a bit of rain and it will be short-lived. Yeah, I, just a, a mess of different weather patterns moving in over the five-day forecast and in particular over the weekend. It will come with double-digit highs on Sunday, but it's going to be a very windy day as well. I'm going to show you that in just a second here. And this is all followed up by a pretty messy mix on Monday that could see more in the way of accumulating snow believe it or not. Here's how it plays out. Uh, for tomorrow, we're looking at uh, partly cloudy skies to mainly cloudy skies. As we move through the evening and overnight period, Sunday early morning, we're expecting to see a line of showers and maybe even a rumble of thunder moving through the GTA. Uh, and this comes with some pretty warm weather, then some scattered showers for Sunday and pretty warm temperatures as well. But as we head through Monday, uh, we get into the cold side of this sort of weather pattern again, and we've got this messy mix. Now, forecast model still a little undecided as to exactly what we're going to see, but it looks like a rain, freezing rain or snow mix as we move through Sunday, uh, or rather uh, Monday into Tuesday. Now, potential snowfall totals here, about 5 to 10 centimeters of snow. I don't think we're going to see that, though. I think it's going to come with some mixed precipitation, uh, but we'll have to watch for that. Definitely a messy Monday. Uh, in terms of the winds, as I mentioned, tomorrow gusts to 40 kilometers per hour, but Sunday, the one to watch. Look at this. Wind gusts upwards to 80 kilometers per hour or more. This is getting very close to warning criteria, so wouldn't be surprised to see some wind warnings being issued for Sunday. So warm weather in store, but also some very windy weather as well uh, as this weather pattern shifts through uh, the GTA for Sunday morning and Sunday afternoon. For tonight, down in southwestern Ontario, temperatures around minus 4 to minus 6 degrees. Wind chills uh, down around minus 12 to minus uh, 9, and then pretty much the same
same story for the Golden Horseshoe. A little bit less in the way of cloud cover here. Temperatures around minus 4 to minus 6. Similar wind chills as well. Tomorrow, high of 4 degrees. And again, uh, looking at increasing cloud cover there. But Sunday, up to 14 degrees. This will come with some isolated showers. Most of it in the morning. The risk of a thunderstorm as well. And Monday, the one to watch here. Uh, it's going to bring with it a messy mix. And whether it's rain, snow, freezing rain, or all of the above, we'll have to wait and see as we get a little bit closer. Kelda. All right. Thanks so much, Nick. The 2022 Winter Paralympics officially opened today following last month's Beijing Winter Olympics, but it's taking place in a world dramatically changed after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Ukraine! Ukraine! The Ukrainian delegation was met with loud cheers of support during the Parade of Nations. The president of the International Paralympic Committee called for peace in his opening ceremony speech. Russian and Belarusian athletes are barred from competition because of their government's role in the war. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says he supports that decision by the governing body of the Games. Team Canada has sent 49 athletes, including four guides, to Beijing. A total of 564 athletes will compete in 78 medal events which will wrap up on March 13th. And Canada already has its first gold medal of the Games. Tonight, Alpine skier Molly Jepsen sped to the top of the podium in women's standing downhill. Finally tonight, Ukraine's national flower, the sunflower, was the inspiration for a snowy tribute by a Manitoba woman. And I uh, came to be aware that the sunflower was the national symbol of Ukraine. I thought, OK, well, what better message? It's kind of a, a, a two messages here, right? Cheerful spring, hopes for spring and peace. Karen Hebert used water-soluble, non-toxic paint and stencils made out of foam plates to get this garden blooming. She says the flowers honor her husband's Ukrainian heritage. And she thinks that with the way the weather has been in Manitoba, the snowy sunflowers will be on display for quite some time. And that is our show for you tonight and for the week. Thank you so much for watching. Shannon Martin has your next local newscast tomorrow at 6. I will see you back here on Monday. Have a great weekend, everyone.